This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. First of all, I, I would like to, to thank uh, Peter Mac and Nick Sison for, for, uh, for this invitation. Uh, the, the opportunity of being in London again, seeing the exhibition one more time, has been a, um, an incredible treat uh, uh, to, to be able to, to see this exhibition over and over again, follow some of the events connected to that. And it's a special pleasure, of course, to be back at the war building this room. I sort of uh, develop a special affection for this room and one of the my first events as a scholar was many, many years ago and then it was Wednesday afternoons, director seminars. <laughs> and um, so, Leonardo and optics. That uh, Leonardo regarded painting as a science based on optics is no news. Back in 1540, the physician and historian Paolo Giovio commented that nothing was more important to him than the rules of optics. But when exactly optics started to play a role in Leonardo's painting, perhaps requires some further consideration. Today, I would like to concentrate on the optical knowledge of the younger Leonardo, the Florentine Leonardo, suggesting that he knew more optics than he had been willing to acknowledge, and that, consequently, his pictorial and optical research went hand in hand from the very beginning. The scope is not merely chronological, although chronology does play a role and has its significance, but also methodological as documentary evidence on the optical knowledge of the young Leonardo eludes us. Only few notes survive from his early years, and among them, very few <coughs> pertains to optics. This fact, the shortage of young, uh, young Leonardo's writings on optics, has encouraged the notion that his way of painting emerge entirely from artistic practice, and that only later, from the mid-1480s onward, when he was at the court of Milan, he attached optics to what he had painted years before. Now, I hope you indulge with me today a little, as I will work inferentially, that is, moving back and forth between the few notes of the 1470s and what we know retrospectively of his later studies, as well as the broader context of scientific writings in the vernacular in the 1470s. If I choose this risky path, it is because I'm unwilling to discard the stunning optical evidence that emerges from Leonardo's paintings and drawings of the 1470s. So let's start from what we know. And that is, we you know, it is documented that in Milan, from the late 1480s onward, Leonardo wrote extensively on optics, hunting books in the library of his patrons, Aristotle, Euclid, Bacon, Vitello, Peckham, and Alison. He intended to write an illustrated book on optics for artists in training, and he found a title for it, The Ombre e Pluci, but never settled for a definitive way to organize it. Like his notes on other topics, his optical writings are notable for the breadth of their intellectual scope, as well as for their fragmented, <coughs> scattered, and repetitious nature. They never left the drafting stage and remain an idiosyncratic combination of notes taken from observation, excerpts from earlier authorities, and recordings of imaginary experiments. But he left behind an unprecedented corpus of ombre e lumi as he drew them in any possible media. Pigments, chalks, pens, silver points, varnishes, and glazes, exploring different systems to represent their relations. Diagram paintings, sketches, detailed drawings, notes, and the treatise. From Leonardo's multimedia, all but scattered optical research, few things emerge. First, optic was for him a fully fledged theory of knowledge, a means to judge depending on context and to learn by comparison. In short, he understood optics as a medieval philosopher had done before him. So it is, for him, optics was really perspectiva naturalis. Second, 
Then I was interested in the blurred edges of Omer Lubi, those edges that can be perceived in suffused light at a close distance, or at least a distance graspable by the human eye. He was immensely fascinated with the colors that Umbre and Lumi acquired by reflection from the atmosphere, from surrounding objects, from a light source, be the candle, window, the sky, or the sun. That is, Umbre and Lumi that are eminently instable and subjective. Finally, his ombre are never dark entities without light. That is, that's a classic definition of what an ombre shadow is. They are actually polluted shadows. That is, shadows that are never fully dark, shadows that are inextricably mixed with light and colors, shadows that are both chiaro and scuro, shadows that are fears of light and color. His optics is of ombre luci is thus an optic of polluted shadows. As for the young Leonardo, uh, he did not, as far as we know, he did not write um, much about, he did not study optics much, and let alone write about it. Um, or in any event, uh, he perhaps wrote something, discarded later what he had written then. And in any event, uh, his written record on optics for the early years is minimal. But his paintings and drawings of the 1470s are full of polluted shadows and seem to suggest a different story. Atmospheric shadows motivated Leonardo's radical revision of drawing technique, which he accomplished in, accomplished in 1473, when he proudly and self-consciously <coughs> dated a landscape. Like others before him, he represented a, la a Tuscan landscape via modern prototypes. It is a mute question whether it is a real or an imaginary place, but it's the only one who cared to capture the haziness and thickness of the atmosphere with quick, sketchy, and blurred marks in ink, while he rendered highlights with the untouched surface of the paper. Polluted shadows are the distinct characteristics of his early landscapes in which a voluminous, almost palpable atmosphere is vibrant with the color of the sun and its own reflection. Such an atmosphere was nowhere to be found in the contemporary, contemporary drawings, not even in those of a, by accomplished masters of the oil technique, such as the Polyol brothers. Really, what I'm really after is, uh, is, uh, is what you can call the atmospheric perspective, that is, uh, that is the thickness of the atmosphere that creates uh, the, not only the fading of colors, but the, the perspective of the as we call it, it is a diminution of details, right? Colored shadows dominate the annunciation, which is in itself for the story of a shadow. When Gabriel explains to Mary that the Holy Spirit will come upon her by overshadowing her, that's, those are the words he utters to her. He is, in fact, the messenger of a shadow. This is the first painting in which Leonardo conflated the metaphorical significance of shadows with the religious story. <coughs> Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, metaphorical, religion, uh, metaphorical significance of shadows in the religious story with his own pictorial interest in the shadows of nature. Many more will come later on. I'm just thinking at the adoration as well, of course, that the Virgin of the Rocks. So the passing of ombre here visualizes the invisible incarnation, the passing of the divine spirit. Bluish shadows appear on the angel's white shirt, Internal shadows masterfully enhance the modeling of the marble base of Mary's lectern, which is also characterized by mono or white significant difference in coloring. The top appears yellowish since it is darkly exposed to the red light of the sun, while the front is bluish since it is exposed only to the indirect blue light of the sky. The gray walls on the palace exposed to the sun are slightly but unmistakably differentiated with yellow touches from the wall facing the viewer, which are slightly more bluish. These were minute variations of color and shadows, but they were clearly <coughs> intended to place firmly figures and things on the painted surface. Later in life, 
Leonardo started uh, the optics of the phenomenon he had painted years before in a note uh, of around 1510, which we know only through uh, the uh, Trigison painting from Nelson's compilation, Libro di Pittura, he explained the rationale for the blue and yellow reflections of the Latin of the Annunciation. Uh, and also he represented the sky as a large reflecting surface in the shape of a, kind of a concave mirror, and that is a graphic convention that he used extensively in his later optical diagrams. The traditional explanation is that this kind of painting emerged <coughs> entirely from artistic practice, and that only later Leonardo sought an optical explanation for the phenomenon he had painted. And indeed, there is good reason for in the uh, in this explanation. <coughs> is unfinished paintings and modern technical analysis, many of which we heard a couple of years ago, this beautiful, amazing uh, conference again organized at the National Gallery. So uh, modern technical analysis confirmed that his ombre e luci became increasingly subtle and undefined due to the increasing immateriality of his mezzi corpi, the pigments he applied, and multiple layers. He drastically reduced lead white from the composition of his mezzi corpi and made his glazes increasingly thin. Now we can even measure the exact thick thickness of those, uh, uh, of those blazes thanks to new X-ray floor sensors. Thinking retrospectively, that is, having knowledge of Leonardo's later optical studies and painting technique, one wonders whether his attention to polluted shadows was not fueled from a very early date by deeper knowledge of optics. Among these early notes, particularly suggestive, seems to me, there's um, this diagram, which, as far as I know, is his earliest diagram of an eye. It is sketchy, basic, and fragmentary, even by the Nato standards. But it is datable you know, to the 1470s, and that dating is based on the paper, the handwriting, and also on the machine that appears on top of the page, uh, which uh, Leonardo labeled as Viticcio di Lanterna. This is a reference to the screw of Brunelleschi's revolving crane that was used to build the lantern of the cathedral, and which Leonardo must have seen in use in the early 1470s when the Rocchio Spalla was put at the very top of the cathedral. Let me show you a detail of this page. Luminous rays come in or out and define the visual field, while the crystalline humor is represented in the shape of a lantern that is slightly curved. An accompanying note explains, Perché l'occhio, venendo le cose sulla sua superficie piccole, di paiono grandi, nasce che la pupilla è specchio cavo. E ancora osserva, per esempio, una fauna di vetro eh, piena d'acqua che qualunque cosa si mette dalla sua parte o dentro o fuori fa maggiore. A few interesting elements emerge from this note and diagram. First of all, it is le cose that go to the eye not the other way around. So yes, we are here talking about information theory, as we uh, write in the 1470s, although it, it is usually thought that information theory, that information theory becomes familiar to Leonardo only at a later date. Second, the eye is compared to a palla di vetro, reasoning that, like water, the palla di vetro, the crystalline humor, makes things look bigger. This is a peculiar sentence, and the question is not whether Leonardo was right or wrong, but from where he could have gotten this idea. Indeed, the comparison between the crystalline humor and the palla di vetro is suggestively close to the description of the crystalline humor as a white, small, human sphere, which is essentially wooden in nature, a description written by Alison, the master of mirrors, whose writings have always been regarded as fundamental to Leonardo's theory. 
Most revealing is the notation that le cose come to the surface of the eye rather than to a point within it, as one would expect according to the optics of medieval Christian authors. The relevance of the surface of the eye to vision was a distinctive contribution of the Arab philosopher Alison, which uh, his medieval followers had dismissed, although that notion was fundamental, fundamental to Alison's theory of knowledge. Leonardo Chiesi knew it already in the 1470s, uh, and I would argue understood its significance not only within Alison's theory of knowledge, but also in relation to his painting of blurred edges and polluted shadows. Alison had explained the formation of the image on the surface of the eye with a simple experiment based on everyday experience. If a needle is pulled close to the eye, the needle does not cover the entire field of vision, but only a part. A fact that, according to Alison, demonstrates that the visual pyramid does not end in a single point within the eye, which the needle would cover, but rather in a larger surface that the needle cannot obstruct. The notion of the surface of the eye as the sign of vision was fundamental to Alison in order to distinguish three different ways to acquire knowledge. First, intuitio that is vision of the centric ray, which is a vision that never errs. Second, aspectus, that is vision of the other rays, which gives momentary knowledge of surrounding elements, and which is then verified, or certified, as Alison would say, with intuition. And then cognition, or knowledge, that is the elaboration of the soul on sensory data that come from both intuition and aspectus. Thus, knowledge is the result of a constant process of certification between intuition and aspectus, between center and periphery, between object and surrounding elements. And we may perhaps recall that the Latin title of Asim's uh, book was, in fact, the aspectus. Always mediated and extended over time, cognition is subject to error if sensory data reach the eye in unfavorable conditions. It is known that Leonardo accepted Ellison's theory of the surface of the eye later in life and wrote about it explicitly in Manuscript D, a notebook dated uh, to 1508 and dedicated to the anatomy of the eye. The bottom on top and the one at the bottom. Uh, although here Leonardo did not explain how the surface of the eye is relevant to painting. To find no indications of that effect, we have to look at somewhere else. And uh, we have to look in uh, to an earlier note. Earlier note, uh, particularly this one coming from the Codex Atlanticus. Uh, in which Leonardo is set to demonstrate come la prospettiva offizio dell'occhio non si riduce in punto. And he again resorted to an experiment with a small object near the eye that is clearly modeled after Alan's experiment with the middle. At the bottom of the page, he debates how the distance between object and light source affects ombre e luci. The relation between surface of the eye and ombre e luci is reinforced on the verse of the same sheet, where Leonardo jotted the scheme for a treatise on light and shadow in seven books, and number tantalized identical to the books that made up the Alison's Despectives. Each book had to be dedicated to a topic of increasing complexity, from original and derivative shadows to intricate color reflections. He wished to write his book, this book because without shadows, we don't know objects, especially se essi non termina in campo vario, in campo di vario colore a quello del corpo. No mention of Alison here. Although Leonardo did trace a diminutive sketch of a head of a man wearing a comic hat, common sign in some psychography to indicate a non-Western salon. 
for its thematic uh, relation to manuscript C and manuscript D around 1490, and their shared physical dimension, and they dated this uh, sheet around 1490, and uh, they find it uh, dating uh, convincing. Those were the years of intense optical research for Leonardo, the years of the Paragone, and the years of the great synthesis of the Virgin of the Rocks, when the optics and spirituality conflated again spectacularly on the surface of the painting. And of course, we are now in a much better position to understand that. One page of manuscript C, which I just uh, um, mentioned, dated around 1490, is particularly relevant that to understand the connection between blurred uh, edges, between blurred edges and the surface of the eye. Discussing how the candlelight and its glow seen from afar remain visible when a stick is placed in front of the eye, Leonardo explains, questo errore viene dall'occhio che piglia le spezie luminose non solamente per l'occulto della luce, per esempio, it's opening, ma etsia con tutta essa luce. It is the surface of the eye that is instrumental to the perception of blurred edges, glows, and reflections, which in turn are germane to judge about the location, situs of objects within their surroundings. Leonardo's reference here to the surface of the eye and to questo errore che viene dall'occhio brings us closer to Alison, specifically to the errors of sight, a long and tedious list of cases of misperception in which the Arab philosopher illustrated the principles of color perspective and visual acuity with myriad of concrete examples. Error of sight depend on many variables, the distance between object, viewer, and light source, their reciprocal orientation, their size, the quality of their body, the opacity, the transparency of the medium, the health of their eyes, among others. For each error of sight, Alison recommended what he called a range of moderation, that is, a range within which knowledge is certain, but outside of which sight errors. His many examples made clear, made, clear, made it clear that the range of moderation is never absolute, rather determined case by case in relation to the range of, the range of moderation of other variables. For instance, for Alison, the best light to know an object is moderate light, neither too faint or too brilliant, but the limits of that range, that is, how faint or how brilliant a light should be, that range of moderation changes in any given situation, depending on the distance of the light and its orientation to viewer and object, as well as the size and color of the light itself, the size of the object, the amount of details the object contains, its colors, thickness of the medium, and so forth. suggested to read uh, Alison's visual effects along Leonardo's paintings. I'm showing you uh, on one uh, an annotation and an uh, infrared image of the painting. For instance, uh, the, for Alison, the range of moderation of the medium, that is when air becomes too, becomes too hazy to, uh, to uh, allow for, uh, for, uh, for, 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 for true knowledge, so that uh, the range of moderation of the medium depends on distance, and that's no surprise, but also on the subtle features of an object. Uh, and that's particularly interesting to think about in relation to Leonardo, and you know, perhaps this according to these notions that Leonardo, that, that Leonardo eliminated details that he already drawn on his panels, but that later judged as too small to be visible in the conditions he had imagined here for the Annunciation, but we can move on as the same thing happens on the Adoration. Alison had illustrated the range of moderation for roughness, what we call roughness, asperitas, 
um, and its opposite smoothness, with examples, examples taken specifically from painting, and that's one of the few instances in which he actually refers specifically to painting rather than to nature. And it's interesting that those examples are not only taken to paint, from painting, but specifically refer to the texture of air, clothes, and fur. Another of uh, Alison's major concerns was the transparency of the medium and its colors, which he illustrates with example pertaining to cloth. How would the color of a cloth appear if seen through the threads of another fabric? Do they mingle or remain separate? Uh, and how would the color of skin look like underneath? The cloak. And as I ventured in an intricate discussion of the narrowness of the thread and the size of the interspace, the colors of the fabric, distance, light source, and so forth. But I think it is suggestive again to think to, to keep this, uh, um, this uh, optical research in mind to try to understand why for Leonardo or Leonardo spent so much time and effort to paint the effect of one fabric under another. So the images, of course, the one, that's an old an old uh, uh, photograph which will be soon replaced by the amazing uh, images that are coming out of that restoration, a drawing that uh, um, interesting because the restoration somehow puts up in a different light also the relation between drawing and painting in, uh, in Leonardo. And then a, 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 a stratigraphic image of, uh, um, of, um, of uh, 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 taken somewhere here, right? So it's the blue dress of the, of the Virgin, the red underneath, uh, uh, the red lake underneath, uh, uh, a red lake uh, that was not absolutely visible, but that is equally painted precisely to insist on this effect of uh, transparency. To Leonardo, Alison's errors of sight he did not provide simply a catalog of visual effects but a framework to test the limits of the range of moderation. He created images that do not simply fall within the range of moderation, as Alison had recommended, but at the limits of that range. In other words, a minimal variation would put the image outside the range of moderation, and the experience that the painting provides would be ambiguous. Its perception would be erroneous and would determine, determine misperception, misperception rather than knowledge. At the same time, these images, at the limit of the range of moderation, stretch the eye, forcing it to an active and continuous process of recognition from the universal to the particular, moving back and forth between intuition and aspectus, subjecting the judgment also to subjecting to judgment also the peripheral areas, what Leonardo called la varietà dei campi, where derivative shadows and their colors are projected the areas indispensable to know things, the areas captured on the surface of the eye. At a deeper level, Leonardo's paintings mimic what Alison called the process of certification, an intense back and forth between sensory data and judgment, sight and soul. Unable to certify what sight sends in, the soul repeats its operation indefinitely over time until it reaches certification. Leonardo's images forced repeat, repeated scrutiny, repeated validation of sensory data to achieve knowledge. This certification applies to the entire painting, except in landscape figures, and above all, to gesture and expressions, the means to visualize the motion of the mind. Optics for Leonardo works both at the level of art making, that is, at the level of figuring out techniques to represent images at the limit of the range of moderation and from the point of view of theory of knowledge, that is, how viewers perceive an image to understand emotions. After all, it was always about emotion. How and when Leonardo read Alison remains unclear, but direct knowledge of his writings, rather than the interpretation provided by his Christian medieval followers, can be traced from the late 14th century onward. 
Among Alison specialists, we should mention Pelacani, the Angelo Pelacani of Parma, who had further developed Alison's theory of knowledge. Sight never errs, but knowledge is never perfect, since it is constantly revised in light of new sensory data, a position even closer to Leonardo's. Particularly significant are Pelacani's ideas on composition a notion discussed by Alison as well, but only in relation to letters and inscriptions, but that Pelican extends to three-dimensional images. Two-dimensional images, which Pelican calls figura superficialis, are, perce are perceived via size, that is, magnitude. But uh, three-dimensional figures, which he called figura corporalis, are perceived via composition, in Another Alison expert must have been Giovanni Fontana, judging from his own description of a prospective text, now lost, that he wrote for his friend Jacopo Bellini, an elusive figure, Fontana declared himself a student of Pelacan, whose personal optical illusions he copied in a number of different texts, some of which are right, the Those, uh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Those, uh, these same uh, illusions appear also in the manuscript in Italian, now in the Riccardiana, which is a drastically abridged and simplified Alison, and which long ago Pavonti attributed to Toscanelli, but that now, perhaps, we can reconnect more securely to the circle of Pelacani and Fontana. Perhaps to that same circle should be connected the Italian translation of Alison's De Aspectibus, which Ghiberti consulted and which may have remained accessible in artistic circles in later decades. I cannot fail to sense Alison's strong influence also in Alberti's De Pictura, perhaps through the mediation of Pelacani, too used to read Alberti via Panoski, that is, to concentrate on linear perspective and to accept this Ciceronian structure from his argument, we might have paid less attention to the optical dimension of his writing. Alberti's three parts of painting, circumscription, composition, and the reception of light, which Baxander has correctly related to ancient rhetoric, and that amazing essay that he wrote in this very building. Uh, so those uh, three parts of uh, paintings are equally inspired by medieval optics. For Alberti, just as for Pelacani, the perception of an object as a solid does not be, need only the perception of magnitude to use Pelacani's terminology, or circumscription, to use Alberti's terminology, but also the perception of composition, which is judged in terms of distance, depression, and relief, that is, in terms of polluted shadows. Alza is the most quoted source in Lorenzo Bisberti's so-called Terzo Commentario, which is totally misleading title since it is not a commentario at all, but a collection of optical writings. Ghiberti's translation are not smooth, but his selection of passages is far from random, revealing instead a deep understanding of each author's contribution and a critical approach to the sources. So much so that one is tempted to suggest that this selection was handed down to Ghiberti, or at the very least, Ghiberti enjoyed the expert guide of somebody who was extremely well versed in optics. In Ghiberti's selection, Alison is the most represented author, as you can see from this diagram. I really one point if I understand what Ghiberti's text or commentary was. And, um, and uh, it's interesting that uh, Ghiberti copied extensive parts of his theory of knowledge, including the passage on image formation on the surface of the eye, from which I started, and some of his errors on sight. He was so taken by the discussion of subtle details uh, that he elaborated this specific part in his own words, uh, adding example taken from his own experience as a sculptor. Such a selection would have provided a ready-made collection of optical writings in the vernacular, in the, in the vernacular that highlighted Alasin's major contributions, as well as the differences with his medieval followers. We know that Leonardo was in close contact with Buonaccorso di Berti, Lorenzo's grandson, who had inherited 
his grandfather's writings. Not only two were absolutely contemporary, they were both born in 1452, but they also share numerous interests, including in Burlesque's machine, this is a complement of two images that are often taken put together from um, you know, showing the same, uh, that commonality of uh, interests. Whatever the pattern of transmission to Leonardo, Alison gives us also uh, gives us a critical language to talk about Leonardo's works, a system of values, concepts, and notions that he shared. From Alison's, Leonardo took the building blocks of his art theory, the optical explanation of the many phenomena that interest him as a painter, the model for his, the model for his form of writing, which indeed came to resemble optical monuments rather than full-fledged humanistic treatises. Like ancient and medieval optical texts, Leonardo's writings were instructions of increasing complexity, illustrated graphically and imparted directly to an apprentice, one at a time. However, these precepts did not instruct the student of painting and workshop practices, such as the mixing of colors or the foreshortening of figures, but rather not to represent <coughs> natural phenomena, phenomena such as shadows, reflected colors, and blurred objects. As we know, Leonardo strenuously trying to come up with a coherent art theory to hand down to the next generation of painters, but he never achieved that synthesis of optical theory and artistic practice. Or perhaps he did, and he had just looked for it in the wrong place, in the form of a complete treatise, a medium that remained always uncongenial to Leonardo, rather than on the surface of his painted image. Thank you. Spirit, you can't represent that. And, 
And, it, and it's not the first one, I think there are presidents, the important presidents in VP, free politics, of you know, using the shadows uh, as, uh, as a way to convey that passage. That is, uh, you can have words, you know, uh, painted words out of, the, uh, out of the mouth of the angel to the virgin, forget about that, it's not. And that's all, you, you can, how do you, how do you transmit the dialogue? How do you transmit that? And I think that's what shadows do here. What is new, I think, in here is that, uh, and I haven't talked at all about that, but, uh, uh, and so it is a, a meditation on the text, on the religious text, sort of going straight to the core of that religious text and sort of, uh, I mean, being captured by overshadowing you. I mean, that, that those particular words that come out of, uh, of, the, of the religious text. And then make those uh, uh, metaphorical words match with a reality in the painting. So that is, when we say, and many people have said, this is the first outdoor, completely outdoor representation of, uh, of, uh, of the administration. May be correct or not, so that is uh, the first uh, so spectacularly outdoor. I think what we see there is the matching of uh, a physical situation in, in, uh, in the painting, that, so that is, that also, that, that in which those shadows are both metaphorical and real at the same time. So I think this is the clash you see in Leonardo over and over again. I see, it, I see it, that happening in the adoration as well, the unfinished adoration. So I think this is the, the best Leonardo. When, when, when this, I think this is the struggle, right? Yeah. Very good question. Thank you, Francesca, for this entirely convincing presentation. I think Leonardo could even have read Fidelity if he would have read the third commentary. Uh, in the sense of the question that he leaves open in the, one of the very rare moments in which he adds a, a, a sentence on his own, he says, um, uh, he states that I hasten and the scholars following him are not particularly clear about the relationship between <coughs> illusionists and aspectus. Um, and that is exactly, I think, Leonardo's program, to find out what's the relationship between spontaneous and simultaneous vision and successive vision in motion. The painting is a beautiful example for that because it requires a very, it suggests a very close uh, viewing point and the view about the perspective, perspective construction. So it can only be um, adequately perceived with um, with a gaze in motion and then with, with uh, vision in motion with, um, uh, with um, um, uh, aspects right. instead of being so Right. Absolutely. I mean, and this is, uh, sort of, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, and this is, uh, I mean, this is a, a model of, of construction of images that then we want to repeat. I mean, it's clear, it's clearly very important formative stage. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, and so that, 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 that part of this appears right uh, very soon. And uh, uh, because, uh, because uh, when, you know, when you don't have that uh, perspective so fixed, I mean, the aspect is moving back and forth, but it's becoming, it becoming as, a, as much, it's actually much more, right? And, you know, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, well, no, no, even here, I mean, this is, uh, you know, oh yeah, absolutely, here as well. Uh, um, it seems to me that the first great artist to explore sort of blurred edges is Donatello in his spot of relief um, uh, works of which the, the um, Christ giving the keys to St. Peter in the DNA is, is the most ambitious example. Um, and I, I wonder how much Leonardo was influenced by those experiments. I mean, Luke in the catalogue um, uh, illustrates the Boston Madonna and Child in squash really um, as an uh, influence on the composition of the um, Louvre um, um, version of Child in St. Anne. And it sort of seems to me that, that, that Leonardo may, that, that may have been you know, kind of a crucial catalyst for him in exploring um, you know, the effect of light on distance and atmosphere. It's, is that something? Can I just add before you? Absolutely, that, go that ahead. Yes. The the um, you know, I think the question becomes one of the way in which he 
tackles or combines the kind of optical text that we've just talked about with, with, with visual precedents in, 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 um, in the front. So don't tell them if I agree, is absolutely something. So you know, it's a question of, is that, is that part of the, is that part of the process? Uh, very much so, I think, and you know, I, um, I mean, if it's harder to work on another, it's perhaps even harder to work uh, on Donatello and his optics. Yeah, but uh, but uh, I uh, and that I mean I'm, I'm, you know uh, intuitively I see Donatello working uh, 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 right like Leonardo working out of his optical texts and trying out uh, techniques. I mean I, I mean I see that uh, as, I mean I see very much Donatello in in, in working in a very similar direction. Of course, this is a sculpture. That's where, where Leonardo comes. I mean, both Ghiberti and both Ghiberti and Donatello do sculpture, do sculpture reliefs, and I uh, mean um, that, that's the origin of the paradox. I mean, that's uh, that's where it starts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yes, and just a question. Yeah. And don't you think that Leonardo's use of shadow? This, the whole spectrum of shadow comes contrary to the concept of spirituality. I mean, how can spirituality be depicted within a realist, materialist shadow? Do you know, I might prevent you answering that question, not because it's not an interesting one, I think it's right. an absolutely key one, but because I think it's something that we need to go on contemplating during the whole of the course of the day. Um, and I think perhaps we'll come back to it in the, in the discussion at, at the end. I think it's a very, very key one to, to take into the next um, paper. Thank you very much, Francesca, again. Um,